chaos and confusion after innocent bystanders, along with a four-year-old girl, were shot at one of America's tourist meccas, Times Square. Today, the NYPD released body camera from those frantic moments, the shooting just one of several over the weekend, including one at a birthday party in Colorado that left six people dead. The fallout tonight after that massive pipeline hack, half of the fuel on the East Coast ground to a halt. What will it do to the price of gas and jet fuel? And can the hackers strike again? And what else might be vulnerable? So if one system goes down, say electricity, other systems also end up cascadingly failing. Major escalation in Israel, the missiles fired at Jerusalem, and what could come next? And with teens now set to be able to receive vaccines, should schools mandate masks? We were put in a very difficult choice of either my husband's health or my son's education. A report on the vastly different experience America's children are having depending on where they live. More marijuana means more opportunities. A lot of the conversation now is uh, how do you make sure that the economic opportunities available are there for the communities most harmed by the war on drugs. As more states move to legalize, our report tonight on what comes next. And the tiger on the loose, the frantic search for a suspected murderer with his tiger. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with breaking news, a move that top doctors say could be the key to getting our country to herd immunity. Late today, the FDA cleared the way for children as young as 12 to start receiving Pfizer's vaccine. The long-anticipated decision could have a significant impact for families, especially for many parents who've been struggling with how to conduct themselves when they are fully vaccinated, but their children are not. The emergency use authorization for Pfizer is for adolescents 12 to 15 years old, and this could mean that all high school students would have the option of being protected by this fall. Victor Kendo leads us off tonight from Miami. Tonight, a major step toward the vaccination of millions of American children. Oh, that doesn't hurt at all. The FDA authorizing the Pfizer vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds after the company reported it was 100% effective in adolescents with no safety concerns. I think these are great news, not only for the young kids, but also for the parents, grandfathers, and for the American society in general. So now we can substantially expand the number of people that will get protected. And particularly, we can go all the way to the entire high school and uh, going down almost all the way to the middle school. So these are very, very good news. Vaccinating children critical to reopening schools in the fall. Layla Farinsky and Isabella Farney volunteered for the trial. You should like do it to help your family, to help your elders, really to do it to keep everyone safe. One day of sickness versus uh, you have a really like versus like two weeks or you know you it could, could get really sick. you could get really sick if everyone's vaccinated it will help like everyone they'll help the whole world with 152 million shots in arms a new incentive for vaccination dr anthony fauci signaling americans may soon see relaxed guidelines for wearing masks indoors we do need to start being more liberal as we get more people vaccinated as you get more people vaccinated the number of cases per day will absolutely go down. We're averaging about 43,000 a day. We've got to get it much, much lower than that. When that gets lower, the risk of any infection, indoor or outdoor, diminishes dramatically. Saying even after the pandemic, Americans may choose to wear masks during certain times of the year, like flu season, to cut the risk of spreading diseases. I think people have gotten used to the fact that wearing masks, clearly, if you look at the data, diminishes respiratory diseases. Victor Kendo joins us now from Miami. And Victor, walk us through the timeline on the Pfizer vaccine. How soon could children who are between 12 and 15 start getting the vaccine? Lindsay, we expect an independent advisory panel to meet on Wednesday to discuss a recommendation to the public. All indications are the CDC director will sign off and vaccinations could start within <coughs> days. Lindsay. Victor Kendo, our thanks to you. The World Health Organization has announced that the India variant of COVID is a global concern. However, they did emphasize that current data shows vaccines remain effective against the strain. This is the country of India continues to just be battered by the virus. As the Ministry of Health reported more than 3,700 deaths just in the past day. That's more than two deaths every minute. ABC's Maggie Rooley is on the ground for us in New Delhi. Tonight, the funeral pyres in New Delhi are still burning. 
People here tell us they have never seen anything like this. The fires here at this crematorium have been burning all day and all night for the past few weeks. The acrid smoke hangs over the city. India suffering an average of nearly 400,000 new cases each day over the past week. Makeshift clinics appearing along the streets for the responsibility of saving lives falls on volunteers working around the clock in 100 degree heat. Many hospitals are overflowing. Our hospital is at 90% COVID patients now. And they're running out of everything. In this wave, there have been more pat uh, patients because of the infectivity. Yeah. Demand for oxygen. Doctors tell us an oxygen tanker that used to last three to four days is now spent in just six hours. And the patients they're seeing are much younger. Experts say vaccines are the key to ending this crisis. But like so much in India right now, they too are in short supply. New Delhi could run out in just days. I apply for vaccine. I, every day I have to apply, but no space. Many are terrified to even leave their homes. This is the quietest people say they've ever seen New Delhi. Stores shut down, areas normally packed and vibrant, now totally empty. One of the country's top medical associations says tonight it's time to expand the lockdown nationwide. And many of the mindset that the entire country should be on lockdown. Maggie Ruley joins us now. Maggie, just kind of give us a sense. We saw you walking on those kind of eerily quiet streets. What you're observing while you're there on the ground? Uh, yeah, Lindsay, this is what's been so interesting. You know, I've always thought of uh, New Delhi as this vibrant, loud place, and it normally is. People say, though, this is the quiet they've ever seen it. I mean, it's eerie, this absence of loud sounds. And we met one man today uh, who was at an outdoor market trying to shop to get groceries for his family, and he told us that he hasn't let his kids out of the house in three weeks. He's not letting them go outside, but he said he has to come get food. He has to feed his family, so he's making the trek out. But you can see in that man just how scared people are to actually leave their homes. So much many people just locking themselves indoors and it leaves a very uh, eerie impression here in the city. All right, and you can understand why. And experts keep talking about the need for vaccines in order to get this under control. Where does the country stand in terms of their rollout? Uh, yeah, Lindsay, this is the big question here. Right now, they're very slow in their rollout. We were at a hospital today. We visited their vaccine line, completely empty. They said they ran out a week ago. When we asked them when they were going to get more vaccines, they said the company told them to call back in a month. And we're seeing that sort of throughout the city. Uh, many reports here on the ground are saying that uh, New Delhi could run out of vaccines in just a handful of days. Now, it's hard to ignore the fact, Lindsay, when we're talking about this, that India is the world leader in vaccine production. So the fact that they don't have any in this country is astonishing to many people. Many people are demanding to know why. Another man we met today said he has been trying every day to sign up for a vaccine, offering to pay money. People are desperate for this right now. They just can't find them. And, of course, you've been on the ground now for a few days. Tell us about how you've seen the community really coming together despite the risks. Uh, yeah, Lindsay, it's always so incredible to watch uh, how communities come together to lift themselves up. And, you know, many people have been blaming the healthcare system, the government, saying they've failed them. But where they failed, the community members stepped in, sometimes total strangers stepping in to help loved ones. I mean, when I tell you, there are just countless makeshift hospitals and clinic oxygen distribution centers. Many of them run by religious organizations here in the city, by just individuals with a taxi cab and an oxygen tank that are driving it around. I mean, it's incredible. Uh, we asked uh, this one man who was volunteering in, in his taxi who was delivering oxygen, why he did it, why take that danger? And he said, well, if I don't, who will? If I don't, someone's going to die. This is what we do for each other. And so in the midst of sort of uh, all of this desperation, there are these really powerful moments where you see the community and the country coming together, Lindsay. Maggie Ruley, our thanks to you. Stay safe and thank you so much for your reporting. Now back to the U.S. and the major cyber attack targeting America's largest pipeline that runs from Texas all the way to New Jersey. Today, the FBI confirmed that a Russian hacking ring was behind it and that they demanded a ransom. What President Biden is now saying and what this means for America's gas prices and airline fuel. Here's ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Tonight, the nation in uncharted territory with a foreign hack which led to shutting down of the East Coast's largest pipeline for three days and counting. We are preparing for multiple possible contingencies and considering what additional steps may be useful to mitigate any potential disruptions to supply. Colonial Pipeline, which is responsible for 45 percent of the East Coast fuel, says it may not be fully back online until the end of the week, which energy analysts say could potentially affect prices and supplies for millions of consumers. At some point in 24 to 48 hours, 
that motorists are starting to see an uptick in the amount of stations that do not have fuel. It affects anyone that needs to drive a car to and from work, to and from school, to and from a store to get groceries. Also potentially impacted, diesel for trucks that carry many of the nation's goods and jet fuel for the region's airports. And a FEMA document obtained by ABC News raises the possibility that the hack could affect COVID-19 transport. The FBI confirming today that a group of hackers based in Russia known as DarkSide developed the so-called ransomware used in the attack. The goal to extort money. There is evidence that the actor's ransomware is in Russia. They have some responsibility to deal with this. While U.S. intelligence has yet to develop evidence to tie Putin's Kremlin to the attack, some analysts emphasize tonight it's important not to rule anything out. U.S. intelligence has said that these kinds of criminal gangs in Eastern Europe and Russia are tied to Russian intelligence. So investigators are going to want to look for the fingerprints of Russian intelligence on this attack. We're joined now by Pierre Thomas. Pierre, what else do investigators know about Dark Side and why they might have chosen this target? Well, Lindsay, you have to think of this organization as a criminal enterprise. Basically, DarkSide develops this ransomware, and they use it to give to other criminals who then share in the profits when they extort companies. So this is an ongoing concern. This group has been involved in multiple attacks before, and the United States government believes there's more to come. And there's also concern tonight about the vulnerability of our infrastructure. We're still on the heels of learning more about the Russian government cyber attack on some of the nation's top companies and federal agencies. Lindsay, we've been overwhelmed with covering the pandemic, but there's been case after case of these ransomware attacks. Sometimes they've impacted hospitals. Uh, sometimes they impacted local governments. So now we're seeing it potentially affect millions of people. It has affected millions and that this entire pipeline, which is more than 5,000 miles, has been shut down. It's a wake-up call, according to my sources. A wake-up call, indeed. Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you. And for more on the larger threat of cyber and ransomware attacks, we bring in ABC News contributor Elizabeth Newman, a former Assistant Secretary of Homeland Security during the Trump administration. Elizabeth, thanks so much for joining us. This was a major attack on America's key infrastructure for sure, but it's also not an isolated case. Give us a sense of just how common these types of cyber attacks are here in the U.S. and also around the world. That's right, Lindsay. It is pretty common uh, to have cyber, cyber attacks, particularly on cr critical infrastructure. We've seen an increase in attacks. Um, uh, in the last year, there, were th uh, there was a 300 percent increase of attacks of ransomware type of attacks, which is what uh, the type of attack on the Colonial Pipeline was. Um, and in particular, over the last year, we've seen a lot of focus on hospitals and other types of critical infrastructure where data is really critical. And so uh, I think what we see in the Colonial pipeline is just um, the tip of the iceberg. We're likely to see more of this. And in December, we first heard about that enormous hack of the information technology firm SolarWinds. And then earlier this year, hackers breached a water treatment plant in Florida in an attempt to poison the local water supply. Those are just two recent cases. How dangerous could these types of cyber attacks become? You just said that we're likely to continue to see them. Um, but I'm especially concerned about when they're aimed at our infrastructure, our health systems like hospitals. That's right. So critical infrastructure is the thing that we often don't think much about, roads and uh, electricity and water and um, the types of things that we rely on for our daily life and, and quite often are interdependent systems. So if one system goes down, say electricity, other systems also end up cascadingly failing. Um, so you take out one and it, the impact may be something that is entirely um, not not the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, this is particularly true of those types of critical infrastructure that are, are the, the core, the hub of what make everything else run, electricity and energy being primary in that. So the concern that we would see failures or attacks on critical infrastructure and those cascading failures has been around for two decades. Uh, uh, cybersecurity experts have been warning that this could happen. And really the first example we saw of a cyber attack affecting a 
physical, uh, in real life, um, critical infrastructure was in Ukraine in 2015, an attack on a power grid that caused an outage for just a couple of hours for about 230,000 people. But it really was the alarm signal that this is really the, our, our future. We are likely to see more of these type of attacks, and that it's going to be more and more disruptive of our daily life unless we do better at building resilience into our systems. And let's look specifically at ransomware. How often are these kinds of ransom simply paid off? Quite frequently. Um, the FBI likes to advise that they don't have the ability to direct, of course, but to advise not to pay the ransom because, of course, that creates incentive for future attacks. But the reality is if you do not have backups of your data, if you don't have a way to operate your system uh, outside of paying the ransom, uh, a lot of insurance companies will advise their clients, go ahead and pay the ransom because that's going to cost less than trying to rebuild an entirely new IT system and take your system offline for weeks, if not months. So more often than not, the ransom is paid. How can we fight off these cyber attacks, especially as our critical systems become more automated and potentially more vulnerable to cyber threats? We need resilience. We need to uh, assume that you're going to have that attack. And it could be as simple as making sure that your data is backed up on a routine basis so that you don't have to pay the ransom because you have the data in a different uh, as sequestered place that you can go and retrieve and resume your operations uh, once you've figured out how they intruded into your network and you've taken care of that intrusion. Um, other ways is we just need to assume that even if you have that good backup, there might be a time period where you can't rely on your automated networks. And lastly, as Pierre reported, President Biden said today that there's no evidence so far that Russia is involved in this pipeline hack, but that Russia has some responsibility to deal with this. So what's the president really saying here? Well, it's been long understood that criminal gangs, um, whether they're cyber gangs or other types of organized crime that operate in the Eastern Europe, in the Russian uh, domain, uh, often have relationships with Russian intelligence. So it's right for the Biden administration to be looking deeper to say, was there anything, is there any sort of direct connection? Uh, perhaps uh, Russia has been rather provocative in the last few years, and they don't seem to have taken kindly with uh, President Biden's tough language. But we don't have evidence uh, yet that there's anything directed. But the idea that they are allowed to operate freely within uh, the Russian sphere of influence, perhaps within Russia itself. It's, it's a sign that Russia is not living up to international norms, that if somebody's committing a crime in your country, you take it seriously, you work with the international community and uh, bring them to justice. Russia doesn't tend to, tend to do that. In fact, they leverage these criminal outfits for their pur purposes. And, and that's, I think, what President Biden was getting at, that there is a responsibility here that Russia Russia owns, even if it did not direct the attack. Elizabeth Newman, thank you so much for your insight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next to the Republican Party facing a critical week in Washington with the White House, with the House expected to oust Representative Liz Cheney from her GOP leadership post for standing firm against former President Trump's false claim of 2020 election fraud. So what happens next in the battle inside the GOP? Here's ABC's congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott. Tonight, the leader of the House Republicans officially urging them to vote Congresswoman Liz Cheney out of leadership. Kevin McCarthy writing, it's clear that we need to make a change. Cheney is being forced out simply because she continues to stand up to former President Donald Trump, insisting the election was legitimate. Elise, how's Elise doing? Right? Openly campaigning to replace her, Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, who voted to overturn the election, earning the endorsement of Trump himself. McCarthy doesn't defend Cheney's right to speak out, instead calling her a distraction. Do you support Elise Stefanik for that job? Yes, I do. He insists the party can't focus on relitigating the past, but one of the few Republicans defending Cheney says and Trump's the one who can't stop talking votes. about the last election. We're the one person oh, continually go. bringing all this back up is not Liz Cheney, it's Donald Trump. He's the one that isn't unifying, but of course, He's out of power, he's a loser, but he's the one that a lot of people fear. Rachel Scott joins us now from Capitol Hill. Rachel, some rare GOP defense for Cheney coming from Senator Joni Ernst today. What did she say and, and what happens next in this leadership fight? 
Well, she said that the party shouldn't really be focusing on cancel culture, that now is the time to come together ahead of 2022 when they're going to try and win back uh, the House. But the next steps forward are pretty clear here, and this could be the final hours that Congresswoman Liz Cheney is in leadership. You're going to have this, this vote happen behind closed doors. It will be a secret ballot, and it will be happening on Wednesday, Lindsay. And meanwhile, President Biden continues to push for his big infrastructure bill. Is this battle inside the GOP hurting the ability to get anything else moving forward? Well, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki was asked this question exactly today, and she said President Joe Biden is focused on trying to bring everyone together and move the country forward. It is notable that this is going to be a very big week, big week for the White House. He will be inviting House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, uh, the majority leader, as well as Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy all over to the White House to discuss infrastructure. Lindsay? Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. And when we come back, the desperate search for the motive. What could have led a shooter to open fire at a birthday party before then turning the gun on himself? What to do if, if you live in a state that has removed mask mandates, but you still feel like you and your children are at risk? But up next, more states legalizing marijuana, and that's creating growing discrepancies in the criminal justice system. What should be done? Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Scott, what's the most hated man in America? You want to talk about the verdict first? Oh, it was crazy. It was horrible. Scott Peterson found guilty of murdering his pregnant wife, Lacey. I think if people step back and look at the evidence in this case, they're going to see this crime isn't solved. Scott Peterson is where he deserves to be. There was information that I had that nobody knew or heard. Now, with his death penalty overturned, will he get another trial? I wasn't the last one to see Lacey that day. 2020, Friday night on ABC. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Scott, what's the most hated man in America? You want to talk about the verdict first? Oh, it was crazy. It was horrible. Scott Peterson found guilty of murdering his pregnant wife, Lacey. I think if people step back and look at the evidence in this case, they're going to see this crime isn't solved. Scott Peterson is where he deserves to be. There was information that I had that nobody knew or heard. Now, with his death penalty overturned, will he get another trial? I wasn't the last one to see Lacey that day. 2020, Friday night on ABC. The Navy has released video of what it says shows Iranian fast boats closing in on American warships. This is, we're learning, a U.S. Coast Guard cutter fired off 30 warning shots in a separate incident after 13 fast attack boats approached while the U.S. fleet passed through the Strait of Hormuz. The Pentagon is calling the Iranian actions unsafe and unprofessional. Their ships broke away after they were just 150 yards away. And now to the growing acceptance of legalized marijuana across the country. Nearly half of Americans now have access to legally purchased marijuana in their home states. And as prominent Democrats are calling for it to be legalized nationwide by next year, some states and communities are hoping that pot, once considered a gateway drug, could now become a gateway for economic and racial justice. Here's ABC's Alex Perche. This is Linda Green's bread and butter, Anacostia Organics. It's an idea born over dinner. With some close girlfriends one night, uh, someone mentioned that D.C. had legalized cannabis. 
And we all looked at each other because we're all in the same age group and products of the 60s and said, we should go in that business. <laughs> Well, Linda, a longtime community organizer in the nation's capital, saw an opportunity to open a marijuana dispensary in one of the city's chronically poverty-stricken areas. This is not a stoner industry. It's been misconceived. It's, it's not a stoner industry. It's an industry of healing. Linda is one of more than 320,000 Americans who work in the cannabis industry. Recreational use of pot is currently legal in 17 states and D.C. Sales in 2020 reached more than $17.5 billion, an incredible boom for an industry during a pandemic, and all of this despite the federal prohibition. The bill is passed. The U.S. House recently passed one of a handful of bills currently working its way through Congress that would strengthen the industry. The SAFE Act would make it easier for cannabis companies to do business in states where sales are legal. It's time for change. I believe the time has come to end the federal prohibition on marijuana in this country. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, speaking on 420, said the time is right for action on legalization. Not only to end the federal prohibition on marijuana, but to ensure restorative justice, protect public health, and implement responsible taxes and regulations. But is the Biden White House ready for it? At the federal level, he supports decriminalizing marijuana use and automatically expunging any prior criminal records. He also supports legalizing medicinal marijuana. So that's his point of view on the issue. But that's not full legalization, and data shows that's what most Americans want. Yay! A recent Pew Research Center poll shows 91 percent of those surveyed say marijuana should be legal. And of those respondents, three in five say cannabis should be legal for both medicinal and recreational use. Less than 10 percent believe pot should remain criminalized across the board. Looking at the current Congress and the current administration, do you feel as though that there is a clock, there is a window in order to get this through? I think there is a window of opportunity right now uh, that um, maybe won't exist in a year. Andrew Friedman was Colorado's so-called cannabis czar. I was the governor's director of marijuana coordination. He created the framework for the first legal pot market in the country and has seen the industry grow from the start. Since 2014, marijuana has made over $10 billion in sales for the state. That's generated more than $400 million in tax revenue used to fund state school-related projects. It seems as though uh, we're getting to a point where it's, it's, about, it's about breaking through the taboo. Where do you think we stand in, in terms of, 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 of that mindset? Yeah, so, you know, if you go to Colorado right now and you have a conversation about cannabis, it's the most normal thing in the world, right? It stands right alongside alcohol. It stands right alongside uh, the Denver Broncos uh, as just a thing to have a conversation about. Andrew now runs the Coalition for Cannabis Policy, Education and Regulation, a think tank that includes big tobacco, big beer, security companies and others who have a stake in the cannabis industry. What's the strategy going forward? So our strategy is really to stop focusing on if legalization should go forward, uh, recognizing that legalization has gone forward. It's a reality for almost half of America. It's here. Point. It's here. Yeah. Uh, and we really need to start talking about how rather than if legalization is a good idea. And the most recent state to legalize marijuana? Virginia. This is tobacco country, part of the Bible Belt. The Commonwealth now the first to legalize recreational use in the South. It happened just last month when Governor Northam signed the law. This is the latest step we are taking toward building a more equitable and just Virginia. And while you won't be able to sell drugs legally for three years, the governor pushed for the legislature to speed up the timetable for legalization of simple possession to limit drug arrests. According to the ACLU, black Americans are nearly four times more likely than white Americans to be arrested for marijuana possession despite similar usage rates. Governor Northam says that he's going to end the disparate treatment of, of, of people of color. Um, I understand that, that this happening in Virginia is, is personal to you. Oh, it's personal. I was on 95 in Virginia when I was pulled over and arrested for cannabis possession. Born and raised in Virginia, I, you know, didn't think that would happen to me. Shanita Penny was charged with possession a decade ago. And it was that simple traffic stop that cost her nearly $3,500 to expunge her record. So this is a, it's a difficult process for someone who's um, pretty reasonably, um, you know, resourced. But for someone who's not, this becomes 
a game changer in the worst way. Despite her run-in with the law, Shanita went on to rise to the top of her profession and work with Fortune 500 companies as a consultant. As the president of MCBA. And today, using her skills in compliance and business development, the one thing that could have ruined Shanita's life is now driving her way of life. It lit a fire under me um, to make legalization happen in a way that people who were not interested in consuming this plant or being a part of this industry, that they would fully understand why legalization is so important and how um, equitable legalization can impact your life, whether you're, again, touching this plan or not. Shanita says she believes her encounter with the law is an example of the staggering racial bias in policing minorities for possession. And as states start to decriminalize and legalize, the movement is turning towards using marijuana laws as a gateway to justice. Why was it so important to, to start with, with, with decriminalization of, of simple possession? We had to understand that if the legislation was truly going to prioritize racial equity and the harm that's been done, that we needed to stop the harm as soon as possible. And advocates say that growing revenue stream for states is being used as a possible source for racial equity and economic opportunity, from drug laws that were historically used to imprison populations of color to now laws that could help fund renewal. A lot of the conversation now is uh, how do you make sure that the economic opportunities available are there for the communities most harmed by the war on drugs? One idea, reparations. This is a historic vote. In March, the town of Evanston, Illinois, passed a resolution where tax revenue from pot sales will be used to help its black residents who faced historic unfair housing practices. $10 million total over 10 years to be used on home repairs or down payments. We have a lot of hopes on the commercial market here, particularly in Virginia, but it is going to be a hard push to, to truly make that equitable. And we would like to really say that this is a first step forward. This is a progressive step forward. Virginia's law includes something called the Cannabis Equity Reinvestment Fund. 30% of tax revenue raised goes towards helping communities historically over-policed for marijuana crimes. And for Linda Green, there's a reinvestment of sorts as well. One of the things that I did was um, I opened my dispensary in the community in which I live. Linda's workers come from her Anacostia neighborhood. She says she teaches them the ins and outs of the industry so that one day this little green plant can be used not only to heal the sick, but also her community. Alex Perche, ABC News, Washington. Our thanks to Alex for that. Still ahead here on Prime, the harrowing video. The officer with a wounded four-year-old shot in the middle of Times Square. The latest on that investigation. In Texas, there's a search for a tiger on the loose and a white pickup truck. And that's not the most bizarre detail. And the stock market continues to, store, sto to soar. So who's winning and losing as the country more fully reopens? We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. Republican Senator Mitt Romney with a warning to his colleagues in the House of Representatives ahead of what could be a very interesting week on Capitol Hill. We will guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Big hug, Tell all our patients how much they love to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. Do you believe?
The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Welcome back, everyone. It was another volatile day on the stock market as the Dow Jones hit a new record high before then tumbling back down due to weakness in technology stocks. Let's take a look by the numbers. For the first time ever, the Dow Jones average crossed the 35,000 mark in midday trading today. The Dow up more than 13% since January. The boom driven in large part by the reopening of the economy with many travel, construction, and retail stocks riding the wave of vaccinations and Americans spending those stimulus checks. Retailers like Home Depot up 30 37% since the start of 2021, and Gap clothing stock up 85% since January. But while the Dow is thriving, some NASDAQ tech stocks that took off during the pandemic are now taking a nosedive. Zoom is down 35% since its latest high point in February as work from home begins scaling back. And home fitness maker Peloton is down 49% since its peak, its latest plunge coming after that recent recall of its treadmills. And while interest rates remain near zero, concerns about a growing economy sparking inflation and future interest rate hikes by the Federal Reserve are hitting tech stocks hardest. But in a welcome sign of the reopening economy, after operating at 50% capacity in recent months, the New York Stock Exchange is now allowing fully vaccinated traders to remove face masks at their desks and more vaccinated staff as well as media will soon be back on the fame trading floor. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The famous trainer suspended the winning derby horse with a failing drug test and the horse racing world holding its collective breath just days before the Preakness. The potential risk to other drivers that led to a massive recall of hundreds of thousands of certain Ford Explorers. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. We will guide you through it all tonight. Made it through another week together. Big, big hug, we tell all our patients how much they're loved. We hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. 
Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. The FDA has expanded its emergency use authorization for Pfizer and its German partner BioNTech for its COVID-19 vaccine to use in 12 to 15 year olds now. The FDA originally issued its emergency authorization in December for people 16 and older. An independent CDC panel will now meet Wednesday to discuss how to get the doses distributed to that age group. The news comes as new coronavirus infections hit a seven month low. Dr. Anthony Fauci suggesting indoor mask requirements could start to be lifted as more people get vaccinated. The CDC will be updating their recommendations and their guidelines. But yes, we do need to start being more liberal as we get more people vaccinated. Police in Colorado Springs are trying to figure out what led to a mass shooting at a birthday party. Seven people have died. No children were hurt. Police say the shooter took his own life. Police believe the killer was the boyfriend of one of the victims. They say he walked into the party just after midnight Sunday morning, began shooting, then took his own life. At least 20 people are reportedly dead in the Gaza Strip after Hamas fired rockets into Israel and Israel retaliated. Benjamin Netanyahu says the attack crossed a, quote, red line. That death toll makes this one of the bloodiest days of fighting in that region in several years. According to Palestinian health officials in the Gaza Strip, of the 20 people dead, nine are children. But there have been casualties on both sides. Now, this escalation in the violence came after Hamas militants fired dozens of rockets rockets into Israel on Monday after hundreds of Palestinians were hurt in clashes with police at the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. Israeli police fired tear gas, stun grenades and rubber bullets as Palestinian protesters threw stones. Israel has come under growing international criticism for what's been described as heavy-handed tactics at that site, especially during Ramadan. We are continuing to closely monitor the violence in Israel. Uh, we have serious concerns about the situation. Ford is recalling more than 620,000 Explorer SUVs in the U.S. because roof rails could fly off while driving and endanger other vehicles. The recall covers 2016 to 2019 model years. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration first started looking into the problem last year. Ford says it is not aware of any accidents or injuries related to the issue. It's a first in any of the major U.S. Christian faiths, the Evangelical Lutheran Church electing a transgender person as a bishop. The Reverend Megan Rohrer will serve in the Sierra Pacific Synod, covering Northern California and Nevada. West Side Patrol got a call about a Bengal tiger in the front yard of a house. The tail of a tiger roaming a neighborhood in Houston is getting stranger by the minute. Right now, authorities are still searching for the tiger and its owner, who apparently was out on bond for a 2017 murder. Well, last night, the cat came face to face with an armed off-duty sheriff's deputy. The deputy ordered the tiger's caretaker to get the tiger back inside. Thankfully, no shots were fired, but Later, the caretaker rushed the tiger away in a Jeep just as police arrived. The owner and the tiger are still on the run. Meanwhile, authorities are checking on reports that there are monkeys also living inside that home. If you see a Cherokee with a big tiger in it, be good to call us. Welcome back. We turn now to the shooting over the weekend in Times Square, right in the heart of New York City. Tonight, video shows how a hero NYPD officer, Alyssa Vogel, sprang into action to save the life of a four-year-old little girl. Here's ABC's Stephanie Ramos. Tonight, the mayor of New York City is praising the quick actions of the officers who responded to a shooting in Times Square. Body camera video showing NYPD officer Alyssa Vogel racing to aid a four-year-old hit by gunfire, using a tourniquet to help stop the bleeding from the girl's wounded leg. As a mom, I think my motherly instincts just 
went to, you know, I need to help her. Vogel then sprints to a waiting ambulance carrying the child as her family follows. When there's a gunshot wound up on your thigh, there's arteries, and I didn't know if an artery was hit or not. It was just before 5 p.m. on Saturday in the heart of Times Square when bullets started flying amid an argument between as many as four men. Three people nearby were shot, including the child. Thank God the three people who were hit, it looks like they'll make a strong recovery. So fortunate that those injuries were not life-threatening. We're joined now by Stephanie Ramos. What's the latest on the investigation? Well, Lindsay, police are still looking for the shooting suspect identified as Farrakhan Muhammad, and police say he was actually identified by his own brother, who was the intended target. And what else do we know about Officer Vogel? So Officer Vogel has been on the force for about four and a half years. She comes from a family of police officers. Her father is a retired officer. Her husband, her brother are still on the force. But she actually started off in education. She was a teacher in Brooklyn, and she says she loves teaching, but she always knew that being a police officer was in her future. And she says now she gets to help people in a different way. Lindsay? Her, her instincts seem to just kick right in there. Stephanie Ramos, our mm -hmm. thanks to you. As more states have moved to reopen and lift mask mandates, the nation's schools have been put in a particularly challenging position, many operating with mask mandates for in-person classes as most students remain unvaccinated. And meanwhile, battle lines have been drawn in communities between parents who still want their children wearing masks in school and those calling to get classes back to normal. ABC's Faith Abube has this story. Like many parents across the country, Amy and Brandon Stafford struggled with the decision to send their children back for in-person learning in the middle of a global health pandemic. Brandon Stafford suffers a condition that puts him at a high risk for the coronavirus, and they feared the kids could bring the virus back home. Hands down, that was the absolute most difficult decision that my husband and I ever had to make. But the Texas parents quickly devised ways to make it work, finding some comfort in a mandate that required students at their kids' school to mask up. But the sense of safety they felt came crashing down on March 2nd. I am ending the statewide mask mandate. Texas Governor Greg Abbott's new order, meaning across the state, schools were no longer required to keep their mask mandate in place, many immediately abandoning or relaxing their stance. We were ready to pull our youngest out, despite his special needs, and which would have been absolutely detrimental to his education. But we were put in a very difficult choice of either my husband's health or my son's education. Zev Capo is the president of the Texas chapter of the American Federation of Teachers. There was a significant level of fear and concern for uh, students, but for the employees in particular that we represent. Texas isn't alone. Like the Lone Star State, 13 other states across the country have now lifted their mask mandates. As pressure to return to normal built, vaccines become widely available and COVID cases drop in many states. But with the I'm pandemic sure. still not over, the decision has pit some communities against each other. Less than 10% of COVID-19 cases in the United States have been among children and adolescents aged five to 17 years. Based on the average number of people we meet throughout our lives, that's about four to five people at this point in your life you're willing to sacrifice so that kids don't have to wear masks in schools. Parents should be given the right to choose, just as our governor has given all of us the right to choose. Parents on both sides of the issue against school administrators and tensions boiling over during school board meetings. It's April 15th, 2021, and it's time. Take these masks off of my child. In some states, schools within the same county making opposite decisions after governors eased their restrictions. One keeping masks in place, the other lifting the restrictions. This virus doesn't consider district lines. Uh, and it doesn't make any sense when you're looking at it from an epidemiological or medical standpoint that you would allow individual districts, uh, many cases where, where a street could be dividing the decision on whether kids and staff wear masks or not. Um, you know, that's just not a way to make public policy. 
In Arkansas, Cross County School Superintendent Nathan Morris lifted his district's mask mandate after Governor Issa Hutchinson's order easing restrictions. While down the street in the same county, Wynn School District has kept its order in place, choosing instead to follow CDC guidelines. At that time that we made the decision, our county was down to under 10 cases uh, and uh, 10 positives in the whole county. Um, we had none in the school. Too many times we're making politically beneficial decisions instead of science and health-based decisions. And this is not a political matter. It's a health matter. The Sorter Family School District in Birdville, Texas, chose to relax its mandate for children in third grade and below, while still requiring masks for older kids. Well, it bothers us for one thing because we have our kids' friends who are in those classrooms. The patchwork of school mask policies in communities across the country also creating some confusion among family members. We have a child in second grade and we have a child in fourth grade. So we have one kid that ha that for our own safety, you know, and for the safety of others wears a mask, but then we have another one who is told, well, you don't have to, it's optional. And I just think that that sends the wrong message. But officials in the Stafford and Sorter families Birdville School District see it from a different view, welcoming the choice to make decisions based on local data and what the majority of their parents want. The nice part is, is Texans do desire uh, local governing, so I applaud that. I, I do wish we'd had a little more time. In Texas and several other states, schools were caught off guard with no plan in place when governors lifted their statewide mask mandates. There were several days where people were almost in a, a paralytic state because they didn't know what was actually going on. I received the email at 4 p.m the night before it went into effect. I didn't know that the special board meeting was even happening. Andrew Morales, a fourth grade social studies teacher, says he was livid after hearing Governor Abbott's announcement lifting the mask mandate. Unclear what was next for him, his students, and school staff. Some of the bigger school districts, I'm sure, were scrambling more so than we were um, on whether or not they were going to receive pushback, how they wanted to, to um, go moving forward. Weeks now into the new normal, the lifting of the statewide mask mandate has also made way for new lawsuits. Bonnie Anderson and five other parents whose school has kept the mask mandate in place despite the governor lifting the requirement are now taking their case to a judge hoping to lift their school's order. The lawsuit was something I've been trying to do all year and there were no attorneys really interested in doing it until there was no governor's order to I say hide behind, but kind of stand, you know, to use as the reason why they were doing that. But no matter where they stand on the issue, one thing many parents agree on is that the pandemic and governors have put schools in a difficult position. By the governor lifting the mandate, that forced a lot of school districts to make some very hard choices. But they should have defaulted to the CDC or, you know, a qualified authority uh, entity in order to make that decision. In Texas, Faith Abube, ABC News. The school debate continues on our thanks to Faith for that. And now to the stunning news about the Kentucky Derby winner, the horse Medina Spirit, failing a post-race drug test tonight. The sports world awaiting the results of a second test. It could confirm or overturn the Derby victory. Our Eva Pilgrim reports. Medina Spirit has won the Kentucky Derby. Tonight, that win in question. Medina Spirit failing a post-race drug test. It was actually a gut punch. Uh, it was something that uh, was not expected. We're gonna we're gonna fight it. Bob Baffert, Medina Spirit's trainer, denying any wrongdoing. We know for certain that we did not give him that. But this is his fifth horse to fail a drug test in a year. Today on Fox News, he claimed he's the victim of cancel culture. The horse arriving today at Pimlico ahead of Saturday's Preakness after testing positive for a corticosteroid, an anti-inflammatory, legal to use, but not within 14 days of a race. For now, the horse racing world waiting on the results of a second test to confirm the accuracy of the first. And let's bring in Eva Pilgrim from the Belmont Racetrack, the site of the third and final Triple Crown event. First, though, the Preakness this weekend in Maryland. The owner tonight says his horse will race again. 
That's right, Lindsay. Baffert says that he will race his horse at the Preakness on Saturday. And the Maryland Jockey Club saying that any decision on if the horse will race will be made after a review of the facts. Keep in mind that these investigations oftentimes take up to a month to complete. Lindsay. And Eva, if better has been on the second place horse nine days ago, who may eventually be declared the winner, are they just out of luck? Yeah, so the winnings from the gambling stay as is, and there were lots of people who bet on these horses, millions of dollars, $11 million worth of bets that were made on the horse that won Medina Spirit. But whatever you won, that's what you got. That's how it will stay. Lindsay? I don't know. Something about that doesn't seem like it may be fair, but we'll see. Okay, Eva Pilgrim, our thanks to you. Before we go tonight, our image of the day. This green is more than just a lawn. It's the symbol of the latest space opening back up in the revival of the arts in New York City. This is Lincoln Center, and the green is being set up to allow for outdoor stages and events ranging from graduations to the ballet. Most of the programming will be free. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, stay on top of several things, including the ABC News exclusive. The parents of one of the two American men sentenced to life for killing a police officer are speaking out and pleading for a lesser sentence. And you are what you eat. That's the saying, at least. But is what's in some of our foods addictive? Stay with us. I've been listening to people telling me I wasn't going to do anything with my life. Mike is a complicated individual. He looked like he could kill somebody. Mike Tyson was called the baddest man on the planet because he was the baddest man on the planet. I was terrified by that brother. He was a money-making machine. I never knew what Tyson I was going to get. His was the most recognizable face on the planet. More than the Pope, more than Queen Elizabeth, more than the President. There were three black men who ruled the world during this time. It was Michael Jordan, Michael Jackson, and it was Mike Tyson. And everybody wanted to be Mike. The only question was, which Mike do you want to be? <laughs> when you think about Mike Tyson in the ring, he was unbeatable. But outside the ring, the only person that defeated him was him. I think Mike Tyson's love-hate relationship with his public is the perfect American tragedy. Robin Givens. He really, really was in love with her. He went bananas. Everyone's like, oh, it's going to work because opposites attract. Yeah. Robin, does he hit you? He shakes, he pushes, he, um, he swings. And then the unexpected happened. His life started to spiral out of control. It's a tragic narrative. I couldn't stop crying. This is this man's life. The obsession remains. It seems that he is unstoppable. It seems that he is forgiven for his crimes. A Hollywood star. This is the male American dream. If you could talk to the 20 year old Mike, what would you say to him? It's gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt bad. It's gonna really hurt. Look at me. Now, new details, stunning new interviews, the climb, the crash, and the comeback. Mike Tyson, as you have not seen. Boom! Welcome to Mike Tyson's world. The staggering documentary event premieres Tuesday night, May 25th on ABC and next day on Hulu.
Scott, what's the most hated man in America? You want to talk about the verdict first? Wow, it was crazy. Horrible. Scott Peterson found guilty of murdering his pregnant wife, Lacey. I think if people step back and look at the evidence in this case, they're going to see this crime isn't solved. Scott Peterson is where he deserves to be. There was information that I had that nobody knew or heard. Now, with his death penalty overturned, will he get another trial? I was the last one to see Lacey that day. 2020, Friday night on ABC. This is American history. A violent white mob, a brutal attack. 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth. The gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News. Available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. The FBI is confirming that the criminal hacking syndicate named Darkside is to blame for that massive cyber attack targeting a major U.S. pipeline. Nearly half of all the fuel to the East Coast is supplied by it. The company that manages the facility says that it could be back in use by the end of the week, but there are concerns that the price of gas and jet fuel could be impacted. Major news in the fight against COVID. The FDA has just issued a emergency authorization for the Pfizer vaccine for children 12 to 15. This expands vaccinations to 17 million more Americans and comes as the nation vaccination rate continues to slide in the wrong direction. But in some positive news, COVID cases are now at their lowest level in seven months. The mother of Ahmaud Aubrey, the black man who was murdered in broad daylight while jogging, says that she is thankful that Georgia has repealed its Civil War era citizens arrest law. A new bill in that state says that bystanders can no longer make an arrest if a crime has been committed in their presence. Georgia's Republican Governor Brian Kemp said that the old bill was, quote, ripe for abuse. Now to the economy, where President Biden says that it'll take some time to dig the country out of a deep hole after the government reported just 266,000 jobs were added to the workforce in April, far below the 1 million payroll economists had predicted. ABC's Elizabeth Schulte reports in from Washington. After a disappointing jobs report showed stumbles in the economic recovery, President Biden is making a push to get Americans back to work. I never said that climbing out of the deep, deep hole our economy was in would be simple. The president announcing state and local governments will finally be eligible to receive $350 billion in aid passed earlier this year in the COVID relief law. And Biden is doubling down on the need for more spending in the form of his $2.3 trillion infrastructure plan. We need to stay focused on the real problems in front of us beating this pandemic and creating jobs. Republicans and some small businesses are pushing back, arguing generous government COVID-related unemployment benefits are preventing Americans from returning to work. I think we've gone too far. We need to get people back to work. The law is clear. If you're receiving unemployment benefits and you're offered a suitable job, you can't refuse that job and just keep getting the unemployment benefits. But economists say it's too soon to say what's behind the slowdown in job growth, pointing to other factors like concerns about workplace health and safety during the pandemic and childcare. The bottom line is there are a lot of hurdles to people coming back into the labor force. 64,000 women dropped out of the workforce in April. Mothers like Katie McAvoy, who lost her job last year and says she stopped looking for work because of her daughter's unpredictable school schedule. You can't take on a job where you're working after hours. You can't take on a job with weekend hours because there's no child care weekend. President Biden is set to discuss his infrastructure plan in a meeting at the White House with top congressional leaders from both parties on Wednesday. Today, he also met with West Virginia Democratic Senator Joe Manchin, who's been skeptical about the price tag of the proposal. Lindsay. Elizabeth, thank you. And now to the mass shooting in Colorado early Sunday morning. Friends and family had gathered for a birthday party when police say a gunman walked in and opened fire, killing six people. ABC's Marcy Gonzalez has the latest. A horrific scene inside this Colorado Springs mobile home park. Looking like we have multiple victims. Seven people dead, including the gunman, after a shooting at a birthday party. Sounds like more shots are still being fired. Keep a distance. Police believe the killer was the boyfriend of one of the victims. They say he walked into the party just after midnight Sunday morning, began shooting, then took his own life. One neighbor who asked that his face not be shown says the community went into lockdown. 
you know, they were looking for somebody or something, but it's just, it's just it's a safety reminder to not look out the window and open the door to anybody. Investigators finding children inside the home. Thankfully, none were injured. The police chief saying, my heart breaks for the families who have lost someone they love and for the children who have lost their parents. Adding officers who responded were all left incredibly shaken. It is one of nearly 200 mass shootings in this country so far this year and the latest in Colorado. Just more than a month after a gunman killed 10 people, including a police officer inside a Boulder supermarket. Our thanks to Marcy. Turning overseas now, there's been a massive rise in tensions in the Middle East with embattled Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu saying that Hamas crossed a red line. That red line, the firing of rockets at Jerusalem. The tensions have led to clashes in front of Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is the third holiest site in Islam. The White House is watching this all closely, and so is our Martha Raddatz, who has more. Tonight, a dramatic escalation in violence. More than 150 rockets launched into Israel from Gaza by the militant group Hamas. And for the first time since the Gaza war in 2014, at least seven of the rockets targeting the holy city of Jerusalem. Air raid sirens wailing as Israelis took cover in their homes, a children's ballet class huddled in a classroom. Amazingly, no one was hurt. Most of the rockets stopped by Israel's defense system, the Iron Dome. But retaliation was swift and deadly. Israeli airstrikes hitting Gaza within hours. The Palestinians saying at least 20 people were killed, including three children. The Israelis saying only three militants were hit. The clashes in Jerusalem have been going on for weeks. Palestinians protesting restriction of movement and the planned eviction of some Palestinians from their homes. This morning, Israeli police armed with stun grenades, rubber bullets, and tear gas facing off with rock-throwing Palestinian protesters at the Al-Aqsa Mosque, one of Islam's holiest sites. Martha Raddatz joins us now. And Martha, I would imagine that the White House has to be concerned that the violence could escalate even further. Uh, they certainly are concerned, and that could happen because the rockets are continuing to fall into Israel. Many of them, of course, as we said, uh, caught by the Iron Dome. But the White House wants this de-escalated, is urging both sides to back off calm down, but watching it very, very closely, Lindsay. And Martha, during the Trump administration, the U.S. slashed funding to the Palestinians, recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital, and told settlers that they have a right to more land in the West Bank. Some believe the Biden administration would bring a reset of sorts, but can you explain to our viewers just how challenging diplomatically this could all get? It, it is so challenging right now, Lindsay. Uh, their election, they're in the middle of election crises on both sides, the Palestinians, Israelis as well. Uh, the Biden administration, that, that capital will remain, I assume. We have our embassy there in Jerusalem, but this is really the first crisis that the Biden administration has faced uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians, and they are taking a, a very cautious approach and, again, trying to de-escalate. Martha Raddatz, our thanks to you. Prosecutors say Finnegan Lee Elder and his friend took part in a botched drug deal that resulted in the stabbing murder of a Roman police officer. The incident outraged and angered many Italians, and after a high-profile trial, the pair now faces Italy's harshest punishment, life in prison. Now the parents of Elder are speaking out and making an emotional plea begging for leniency. Amy Robach reports. Watching your, your son mature in prison is very hard. The parents of Finnegan Lee Elder, the 21-year-old now sentenced to life in prison for the murder of an Italian police officer, breaking their silence. And there's a lot of things in Finn's reality now of his life as a prisoner that I just can't think about. It's too hard. It's too painful. This tragedy that happened, it's changed us all. Elder and his friend, 20-year-old Gabrielle Natali Horth, were vacationing in Rome in July 2019 when they tried to buy cocaine. The drug deal went wrong, and police say they were called in as part of a sting operation. 
When Vice Brigadier Mario Churchiello Rega and his partner went to meet the American teens, prosecutors say Finnegan fatally stabbed Churchiello Rega 11 times with a seven inch knife. Now he and Natalie Horth are facing life behind bars in Italy. He feels like he has been sentenced to something worse than the death penalty. Finnegan's parents arguing the punishment far outweighs the crime and that their son has been deeply mischaracterized. Finnegan, first and foremost, has an incredibly kind and very, very gentle soul. Um, he is honest to the point of, um, I used to say when he was younger that Finn vomits the truth. He does not see a reason to lie. Um, so he's incredibly kind, he's incredibly sensitive, and he's painfully, painfully honest. Churchiello Rega was slain just a month after his wedding, his widow there in the courtroom when the guilty verdict was read. Finnegan's mother overcome with emotion and his father reportedly yelling out, Finnegan, I love you, as his son was led out of the courtroom. Now his parents concerned about their son's mental state, saying he suffers from depression. I understand that a man's life was lost that night. I understand that Finnegan should serve some time. I would like Finnegan to have some sort of sentence that's proportionate and something that helps um, at least acknowledges his mental health issues. Finnegan's American attorney believes the life sentence, Italy's most severe punishment, is too harsh and they're appealing. And they gave him and they gave Gabe a sentence that is befitting a mafia boss who wantonly kills innocent people. How could these two boys possibly be in that same league? Well, thanks to Amy for that. And still to come, the stunning undercover video that shows the Queen's cousin allegedly trying to leverage his ties to the crown to sell influence in Russia. And are some of the foods that we eat addictive on purpose? Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. 
Welcome back. We're tracking several international headlines at this hour. The death toll continues to rise after the horrific bombing at a school. Officials believe schoolgirls were the intended target. At least 85 were killed when a car bomb exploded near the school entrance. Two other bombs exploded as students rushed out. The Taliban, though, says it wasn't them pointing the finger at ISIS instead. Russian state media is reporting that the doctor who treated fierce Putin critic Alexei Navalny immediately after he was recently poisoned with death with the deadly nerve agent has been found alive. This is after he went missing three days ago while on a hunting trip. On Russian TV, his wife said that they spoke on the phone. All other details remain murky at best. And this picturesque castle in Transylvania is believed to be the inspiration behind Bram Stoker's novel Dracula. It's now perhaps the strangest COVID vaccination pop-up center today. Every weekend through May, there will be vaccination marathons in the 14th century castle. No appointments are necessary. Next to the undercover video of the Queen's cousin, who's accused of trying to leverage his ties to the crown to a company wanting to do business in Russia, Lama Hassan has more. Royals recorded. The Queen's cousin, Prince Michael of Kent, caught out on tape. In new videos released by UK's Channel 4 Dispatches and the Sunday Times, the prince appearing to use his royal status to help pitch a business to the Russian Kremlin in exchange for money. The fee, 200,000 US dollars that we have offered, was it acceptable, sir? Oh, yes, sir. Very much, sir. Thank you. The clips, which are part of a show, Royals for Hire, airing tonight in the UK, show undercover reporters posing as investors from a bogus South Korean gold company, House of Haedong. 78-year-old Prince Michael appears to offer to make confidential representations to President Putin's team on their behalf. Is it in line with what you normally charge for a speech like this, sir? Yes, indeed, so I have no no uh, questions for you on that. Prince Michael's think, friend and business uh, partner, Lord Reading, floating the idea of making time. connections with Russian I President Vladimir Putin. Involved. We relatively discreetly here because we wouldn't want um, the world to know that he's seeing Putin um, uh, purely for business reasons, so if you follow me. Prince Michael has long-standing ties with Russia, but a spokesman tells ABC News he has never represented Buckingham Palace there and has no special relationship with President Putin. While Prince Michael isn't a working member of the royal family and doesn't receive public funds, the exchanges raising eyebrows. The royal family, the monarchy, is part of our system of government. And if members or the people around them are leveraging royalness for personal gain. That really goes against what the institution stands for. This isn't the first time a royal has been caught in a sting operation by journalists. Both Sarah Ferguson, Prince Andrew's ex-wife, and Sophie Wessex, Prince Edward's wife, have fallen foul of tabloid journalists posing as businessmen. Both cases causing deep embarrassment and unwanted scandal for the Crown. Our thanks to Lama. And tonight, buy or rent? Our Rebecca Jarvis looks at the home ownership decisions facing many across the country and how you can decide what's best for your pocketbook. Carrie Thorpe and boyfriend Brendan have been renting this two-bedroom, pet-friendly apartment for the last two years. Our kitchen, we have a nice little bar area over here. When the pandemic hit, they had to reassess. We have three animals, so it definitely got cramped pretty quickly. We love it a lot. It's just uh, we definitely feel like we've outgrown it a bit. Now they're debating their next move, to rent or to buy. We want to be able to take advantage of the low interest rates and all of the benefits of purchasing right now but then there's also houses that are a little bit inflated with with the prices an intimidating decision anytime but especially now home listings down 37 percent versus last year the amount of potential buyers up 53 percent meantime more available rentals in almost every region of the country compared to 2020 we're putting money towards rent that we could be putting towards a mortgage and really setting our futures up for for more success what to do? We asked Million Dollar Listing star Frederick Eklund to help Carrie and Brendan think it through. First question, how long do you plan to stay? Sometimes it does make sense to rent because you're not really sure where you're moving, uh, your situation, sure, rent. But if you are sort of know where you're going in life and where you're going to live, I would say jump into the market now and lock that interest rate in now. Next up, what can you really afford? It's important to put down at least, I would say, 20 
20, 25%. Try to put down as much as you possibly can. A good rule of thumb, your house payments, that's your mortgage payment, including things like property taxes and homeowners insurance, should not exceed 25% of your monthly take-home pay. Carrie and Brendan deciding to take the plunge. We just put our first offer in on a house three weeks ago. We quickly became outbid and did not end up getting the house. Extending their current lease for a shorter period until they can find the house they want at a price they can afford. Still looking, absolutely. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Our thanks to Rebecca for that. Turning now to something that many people have been doing more of during the pandemic, eating. Some people have joked about the COVID-15 relative to weight gain during this time, as some have turned to food as a comfort. But what is it about food that can make it so addictive? Here to help us break it all down is Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist, Mr. Michael Moss. His New York Times bestseller, Salt, Sugar, Fat, illuminated the world as to how the food industry used these three ingredients to hook a nation guilty is charged right here. And now in his newest book, Hooked, Food, Free Will, and How the Food Giants Exploit Our Addictions, he explores how the processed food industry exploits evolutionary instincts and the relationship that we have with food. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. First, I have to tell you, I'm not yet a recovering uh, sugar addict. So I'm, I'm trying to work on that. Hopefully you can kind of walk me through here. But look, in your book, you talk about how addiction falls on a spectrum. Why is it that some people are only mildly affected by their addiction and others succumb entirely to it? You know, I think it's so many things, but one of the factors and one of the high, you know the hallmarks of addiction is that even cigarettes, alcohol, and narcotics affect people differently. There are casual smokers, moderate drinkers, casual users, even of heroin. Um, and so food affects people differently too at different times in our lives, at different times of the day, right? That 3 p.m. craving for cookies that hits us isn't around in the morning for some people. And so it just depends on various factors that are affecting us, stress, emotion, memories, lots of things. Yeah, I, had, uh, I must admit I had a little chocolate right before coming down to talk to you. But uh, talk to us about potato chips and why those are particularly problematic by design. Yeah, so in salt, sugar, fat, I talked about the kind of the three, the trinity of ingredients, salt, sugar, fat, and, you know, the potato chip being one of my favorites, right? Um, salt, the industry calls the flavor burst because it's typically on the outside of processed food, especially snacks. Uh, it's the first thing that hits the taste buds, sends that signal right to the reward center of the brain, which sends that signal back to you saying, hey, wow, Michael, I love that. Let's have more of that. But the other thing about potato chips I didn't know until talking to nutritionists is it's actually pretty loaded with sugar in the form of simple potato starch that gets converted into sugar into our body. So you have this kind of trifecta of these additives, but here's what the news research says. As troubled of, as many of us are by sugar as a trigger for cravings, it's actually the combination of sugar and fat that you find in so many processed foods that affects us even more. And you also discuss the importance of a go versus stop brain when it comes to our eating habits. Explain why our brain toggles back and forth between go and stop and why this concept is so important when it comes to food and free will. Yes, yeah, so scientists love to divide the brain into those two parts. The go brain is kind of the primitive part of the brain that gets us to do things like run from danger and eat to put fuel into our bodies. The stop part of the brain typically kind of thought of as being in the front where executive function is, where willpower resides, is what gets us to say, hey, wait a minute, Michael, I'm not so sure eating that bag of potato chips right now is like a really a good thing to do, even though the Go Brain is telling you. These products we're talking about, which populate a large part of the grocery store and a good number of restaurants, especially the fast food industry, are designed in a way that activates, excites the Go Brain so much that the Stop Brain doesn't have a chance to activate get going and put the brakes on stuff like overeating. And I would argue that sort of in some ways that, you know, this notion of us lacking willpower um, is just not right. This is not on us. Weight gain, obesity, this is coming from these products that are designed in a way that destroys our free will because of the way they go after the go brain. How do you think that the relationship to food has been impacted as a result of the pandemic? 
Yeah, so we thought with the pandemic that at least we'd get away from the bending machine at work. I mean, arguably one of the most treacherous parts of the processed food industry, right? Under the stress and the strain of the pandemic, we began buying foods that we hadn't had since we were kids. The companies were elated by the sales. They're still going on. And what's going on there is this phenomena of memory, which I argue makes food products, these food products, kind of even more problematic than cigarettes, alcohol, and drugs, because we start forming memories for food at an incredibly early age, possibly even still in the womb, depending on what our mother is eating. And we hold those memories for life, often associating them with like a joyous moment. Lastly, just in our final minute here, what do you think that people truly need to understand about addiction? Um, I think there are lessons to be learned from addiction, right? So if you're the kind of person who gets a 3 p.m. craving for cookies, one of the things we learn from looking at the drug world is that cravings happen so fast and are so strong and destroy our free will so effectively that no matter what your strategy is, whether it's to get up and stretch or call a friend or have something healthier like a handful of nuts, you pretty much need to be executing that at like 2.55 to get ahead of the 3 p.m. craving. I think the other lesson here too is that we can turn the tables on these companies and reclaim things they took for us including convenience. The more cooking we can do for ourselves, the more mindful we will be about food. And it doesn't have to be complicated. I've got a spaghetti sauce recipe down to 93 seconds. Granted, the more it simmers, the more apt my family is to eat it. But still, home-cooked foods don't have to be inconvenient. Michael Moss, we thank you so much. You can find Hooked Food, Free Will, and How the Food Giants Exploit Our Addictions wherever books are sold. Finally tonight, our Will Gans reports on a runaway rescue dog that made a break for it out of a New York City apartment and even made it right onto the subway. Lucy! Looks like Lucy has some splaining to do. Lucy! But it's this Lucy who's in trouble following a wild weekend in New York City. Lucy is an emotional support dog for 76-year-old Susan Malone, currently in the hospital after breaking her arm and leg. When a family friend stopped by to take Lucy for a walk while mom recovers, Lucy got spooked and made a break for it. The rescue pup running into the open elevator, making it down to the lobby, past the doorman, out the door, across the highway, and into the subway station. Susan's daughter Molly joining the chase. 10 hours in total on the trains and in the tunnels, looking for Lucy. At one point, power totally shut off for one, two, and three trains as the search wore on. Finally, an MTA worker and Molly spotting the runaway pup on the tracks three miles away from where she got loose at 34th Street. Actually positioned myself on the tracks. Lucy was walking in a straight line. I just stood in her way. She walked right to me and I was able to pick her up and actually, um, um, board her, uh, get her, get onto the train, and right into her owner's arms. The line supervisor, Jose Bonilla, who's my hero, uh, jumped out, grabbed her, and handed her to me through the front of the train. Um, he, Lucy, bit him for his trouble. Lucy understandably spooked after a day in the dark underneath Gotham. In desperate need of a bath and a big bowl of water to drink, but Lucy perfectly happy to head back home with Molly, how else? On the subway. Lucy. Lucy, Lucy. Lucy may not be venturing out anytime soon. That is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.